Now, in the State Capture Commission inquiry today, Feiki Mentur finished her testimony and former government spokesperson Temba Maseko took to the stand. For a wrap of the evidence led thus far, we're now joined by Tiso Black Star senior legal journalist uh, Karen Morn. She's with us on Skype. Let's see if we can bring her up. Uh, Karen, uh, we'll, while we try and get your, your face up, let's wrap up the testimony of Feiki Mentur. Some have denied what she said. Some have accused her of not being as uh, coherent as um, BC Jonas has been, but, but she certainly raised serious questions that demand answers, hasn't she? Well, I think it's going to be very interesting to see how the Guptas handle um, the cross-examination of her because her revelations, if they are to be believed, certainly paid a very scary picture of a family that was essentially performing state functions in terms of, um, on the version of her evidence, serving as an advance party for President Jacob Zuma at that stage when he visited China in 2010 during a state visit. Um, she has made a lot of allegations which I think are going to be the subject of very uh, strong cross-examination. I did speak to her after she gave her evidence and asked her specifically about how she felt about the prospect of, of cross-examination. She is adamant that her story and her version and her evidence will not change and she says she looks forward to the opportunity to address the kind of uh, criticisms that she certainly has been aware of um, in the social media space and that have been directed towards her credibility as a witness. All right, then Temba Maseko takes to the stand. Uh, remind us how he has directly implicated former President Jacob Zuma. Well, this is crucial um, evidence for the state capture inquiry. He related um, incidents that occurred in 2010 where, you know, at that stage, the Gupta family may have been sort of at the periphery of South Africa's public imagination, but certainly weren't the huge um, players that they would subsequently become. His version is that uh, there had been speculation for quite some time that they were going to take over ownership or, or get get into the media business with the New Age newspaper. Subsequently, of course, they also had um, ANN7 TV station. And that essentially his evidence, which he started giving today, was that um, he was called by RJ Gupta, who he knew um, through previous engagements with, um, with him, um, to, to basically set up a meeting um, in which a certain project would be discussed that required government support. Now, the evidence of of Maseko to the public protector, which he's yet to give us in this inquiry, is essentially that prior, to, while he was driving on his way to this meeting, um, former President Jacob Zuma, then the president, phoned him and told him in Zulu that he needed to help um, the Gupta family. Now, of course, Temba Maseko giving evidence that he was essentially in charge of a 2010 GCIS budget of 600 million rand. And the suggestion very much being in his evidence, which will play out tomorrow as well, that basically what the president, the former president, wanted him to do was channel some of that 600 million rand in the direction of his friends. Yeah, so it ended on a bit of a cliffhanger today because everyone was waiting for that evidence. But let's go back. So Temba Maseko, a government spokesperson. Uh, Karen, stay with us. Uh, let's see what he started saying this morning. He explained that public servants have been scared to come forward with information for fear of reprisals. Let's listen. Uh, okay, and you, you, you stated, if I may start again, that you stay. Firstly, we welcome the call of hand, more or less, when you would have signed. Chairperson, and of course, for my own benefit too, ask you to identify. At the date of this memorandum, the President of the Republic of South Africa was. Service of the post apartheid era. All right, unfortunately, we didn't uh, find the precise bite for you. We'll work on that. Uh, but so you tell us, uh, Karen, what, what he was saying, that, that people are simply scared. 
I think what was interesting is that we saw at the beginning of this inquiry the Deputy Chief Justice Ray Zondor say, urging members of the public, members of the legislature, members of the executive, ordinary people to come forward with um, evidence of state capture and very much suggesting, actually stating explicitly, Francis, that he was quote unquote disappointed um, with the commission's, the response to the commission's uh, request for people to come forward with evidence. And Temba Maseko really being asked to elaborate on that, specifically in the context of this memorandum that had been signed by several former um, directors general in which they expressed grave concern um, about what had been happening in terms of this, um, you know, political leaders within government basically putting uh, people beneath them under pressure to do things that weren't necessarily in line with the Public Finance Management Act. And essentially suggesting that people were being asked to circumvent the law to further the interests of a particular family. Lucy Piccoli, the former NDPP, amongst uh, some of the people that signed that. Um, and, you know, he was pushed by the Commission and by the DCJ to really go into whether these people who had signed um, the statement, who'd spoken to him, DGs who were also currently in government, would be prepared to testify. And he suggested that the inquiry should approach them, but very much tried to explain that there was this fear of reprisal um, that people felt if they spoke out. And this may be um, a somewhat key factor, despite the change in political environment that South Africa's experienced, that may be stopping people from talking, uh, speaking out. Let's see if we can bring you another bite, uh, Karen, and, and because he, he continued, he explained that the Hawks were and then weren't looking into uh, evidence. Uh, part of this theme of uh, law enforcement authorities not being trusted. Let's see if we can bring you that. Around um, April 2018, I got a call from the Hawks requesting a meeting with me to take the matter forward. Um, they informed me that the matter had now been handed over from Captain Governor to a new team of investigators who are now preparing um, <clears throat> to take the matter to court. And what they told me was that they were looking at uh, possibly charging Mr. Ajay Gupta mm -hmm. um, and President Zuma, mm -hmm. and they wanted to just go through the affidavit, the two affidavits again, in preparation of that matter. So the meeting did take place. Uh, I can confirm the date. Uh, it's probably in my diary. Um, so I was given the impression that they were actually getting ready to, to, to proceed with the case. Um, if, if I may just add one little detail, Chairperson. Um, subsequent to the raid of the Sex, sex and World compound, in some of the media statements, I did read that um, one of the matters that the Hawks said they were investigating was my complaint, the issue that I had raised in my office of it. Um, but a few weeks after that exchange, they then came back to me to inform me that uh, my, that matter, my matter was no longer going to be followed through. So as, as I'm sitting here, I'm under the impression that, in fact, that matter has been, I think they, the words they used was that the matter has been put in a bands or something, but it's no longer happening. I should relax. You should relax. So, Karen, again, the Hawks mentioned in an unflattering light. Um, I think what's fascinating about this particular assertion is that um, it reveals concretely for the first time um, that the former president is actually um, or was the subject of a criminal investigation by the Hawks. Now, we've yet to get kind of a substantive response from them on this particular issue. But I think it does confirm that, in fact, um, there was an investigation that was launched against uh, the president himself. And it's really been the 
the first time, Francis, that that revelation has been made. But it's interesting to see how advocate Vincent Maleka, who is, of course, one of the key legal advisors within this inquiry, has made a point today of telling uh, the deputy chief justice that, in fact, this issue of how the Hawks handle these cases is going to be a key and pivotal point within uh, how the inquiry does its work. And it's uh, the kind of revelations and information that it wishes to bring to the attention of the inquiry and to the public. As you rightly point out, we heard Fakey Mentor claim that um, her statement had been interfered with, that she was told to remove references uh, to President Jacob Zuma, otherwise that she was she testified, the investigator told her, quote unquote, our hands are tied. We also heard from Nkabisi Jonas that this extraordinary revelation that a very senior police official within the Hawks, Zintle Nonopi, came to him with a prepared statement which would have effectively shut down the criminal investigation of his claims that he'd been offered a bribe by the Gupta family to take on the minister, the, the position of finance minister. And then, of course, these kind of extraordinary claims by Fakey Mentor of, of the Hawks taking away her statement um, and, and interfering with it. So this has been a relatively common theme within the evidence that we've heard so far, so much so that Vincent Malek has chosen to highlight it to the inquiry. And one really has to wonder, um, we know that, uh, you know, the, the Major General Nonopi has applied for the right to cross-examine, as has another police official who's been implicated in this evidence. But a real key question about the, the former head of the Hawks, Burning in Tlemeza, who, of course, was the man who very much drove the thwarted prosecution of the Finance Minister Pravin Gordon, whether he will be prepared to come and give evidence or whether indeed the inquiry will in fact subpoena him to get his side of the story about these claims, essentially, uh, which back up what um, Kabisi Jonas says RJ Gupta told him, mm. i.e. we are in control of everything, including the Hawks. So, so the Hawks did release a statement saying they would follow the proceedings closely and, and they would like to respond. And, and there are people who are, are saying they're clamoring to get their sides in. Has, has the commission now outlined exactly how that process is all going to work? Well, we know that those two police officials, uh, Monopi and Matola, have applied for the right to cross-examine um, Fakey Mentor and Jonas about their about their evidence. Um, you know, the, the commission does have powers to subpoena. So if this thread that Vincent Malek has referred to of the Hawks um, effectively being utilized as a political agent or trying to shut down politically problematic investigations becomes, um, you know, you know, continues within this inquiry, I very much suspect that the uh, former head of the Hawks, Bernie Intlemeza, will be subpoenaed to give evidence. I think what's also interesting is that um, Temba Maseko himself acknowledged that the Hawks of, of that particular era are not specifically the Hawks of today, that there have been attempts by that organization to rectify itself, that in fact um, an investigation that had been launched against him um, in the wake of his allegations of state capture um, in relating to a tender that had occurred 13 years ago when he was at the Department of Public Works as a DG, that once revelations about that um, Hawks investigation came into the public domain, he was personally contacted by the new head of the Hawks who sought to find out what the status of, of the investigation was and really deal um, with this kind of perception that effectively the Hawks were being utilized to carry out a witch hunt against him and Maseko. I think the Hawks are very conscious of the fact that they are going to have to deal with a huge public perception issue in the wake of these revelations, but I think there will be an attempt by them to really um, try and calm the kind of public fear that exists with this kind of evidence that effectively they're a politically controlled organization that is not acting in the interests of ordinary South Africans. All right, and then Timber Maseko continued. There was a bit of a detour about his time uh, in, in public works, a tender he was involved in, and, and it ended before he got to the juicy stuff. So what can we expect for the rest of the week? 
Well, exactly. It's it's he's going to tomorrow outline this um, meeting that he says he had uh, with RJ Gupta. But of course, that crucial phone call that he says he received from President Jacob Zuma um, before he had that meeting with RJ Gupta, in which he was told to assist the Guptas. He's also claimed that um, RJ Gupta spoke to him in an incredibly disrespectful manner. That he was essentially, as a, a an employee of the presidency, um, spoken to in a very demeaning way, and basically um, essentially essentially, you know, forced into a situation where it was essentially being coerced into give, channeling this money from GCIS to these Gupta um, companies. And the really, the really deep insights into that meeting, the demeanor of Ajay Gupta and what was said um, during that encounter. And I think that is going to be a particularly fascinating piece of evidence tomorrow. All right, Karen Moore uh, from Tiso Blackstar. Always a pleasure to chat to you. Thank you very much.